I've been developing for, for, for my students at, at UCL, but it's really to think about, it's really to help us think about the construction of race, the invention of race as we currently perceive it, um, but also the inherent biases that are built into the scientific process more, I, I think arguably broadly across all science, but very specifically within uh, human sciences, which starts off as a sort of classification and, you know, branches off in the 19th century into various disciplines that we continue to study today, uh, and specifically um, uh, human genetics and population genetics. Now, the, a, a week ago was the 20, uh, 100, sorry, 20, 150th anniversary of the publication of uh, what I think is Darwin's second most important book but my favorite which is the descent of man so it's 150 years since that was published and darwin as in all of my work features quite heavily and will come up in this in this talk um this is the only mention i love this quote this is the only mention of humans in the origin of species published 12 years before this and it's just a sort of amazing um teaser for what will come next and then he goes on to write the descent of man and um in in, in which he applies um, his his ideas about evolution by natural selection onto us. It's an incredibly important book. It is a flawed masterpiece. It is of its time. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the talk. But I think that's the one to, to read um, if you're interested in the genesis of the ideas of evolution as they, relation, as, as, as they relate to us. Okay, now there will be some sensitive things I'll be talking about in here, so this, this comes with a, a slight warning that some of the topics are um, relate to a pretty pernicious history about, about race. Um, um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, this is, this is a, a, a version of a lecture I give to first year undergraduates and second year medical students, as well as this is a sort of the, the broader version of that. Um, and I want to throw, I know a lot of you listening will be, will be scientists, and I want to throw open a couple of statements which are really sort of talking or thinking points more than anything. And they're not, I, I don't know how controversial people perceive these two ideas to be, but I certainly get a lot of pushback because I know that there is a noble aim within science, that the whole point of it is to extract our subjectivity so that we can observe the world and the universe and humans and life as it really is, rather than with all this limited perception and psychological baggage. Having said that, it is never the case that science, I, I believe, it's never the case that science is not political and it is never the case that our data sets are neutral. Did I phrase that right? Yes. Well, basically what I'm trying to express what is written on that slide, so just pay attention to, to that. And I, I think these are interesting discussion points to have with students uh, of any age, but also things that we should be aware of in our own fields as, as researchers, because it's all too easy to forget that these two things are demonstrably correct. And then there's a third point, which I think is really important for the human geneticists and how we talk about genetics, which is that I don't think that we have the language to describe what it is that we do. And I'll talk about that in more detail, but fundamentally we have a lexicon in academic biology, in academic genetics more specifically, which is closely related to, but diff distinct from medical genetics, from the clinic, from anthropology, and also many of those words also exist in the common vernacular and how people talk about families and populations and races. And as a result of that, there is an enormous degree of confusion, which neither serves a, a sort of political progressive outlook, and equally importantly, it doesn't serve the science itself. So this is a, an idea that I think is really important for us to think about as, as researchers. And then this, this sentence, which I, you know, with incredible vanity have just plucked from one of my own, own books, which is, I think, a statement, which I, again, something for us to think about as, as academics, is that if we work in human genetics, then we have to speak about race. And, and by extension or related, we also have to talk about the history of eugenics. Um, that's all very well for me to say because this is my career, this is what I do and this is what I lecture and write, write about, but I think it's important, it's incumbent upon everyone within this field, human genetics, as it is as a you know, sort of huge, um, uh, huge area, to take this on board and actually adopt this as, a, as an attitude that we, we need to fold in the pernicious history of our fields into the teaching of our fields.
not simply because it's interesting, but because it informs the way we behave and it informs the way we teach our subjects today. So those are the sort of key ideas I want to I want to talk about. Now, um, you know, some background. We I, I spend a lot of time talking about race. I don't feel like I need to justify that now. That the idea conversations in the public discourse about race are more prominent than they have been in uh, a long time. In in um, many years, possibly decades. And that, that is one of the reasons why we're talking about, we, we talk about race a lot. Uh, alongside that, in the last 20 years, since the Human Genome Project published its first draft, which was in 2000, um, we've seen this enormous growth. You know, it's a real boom period for, for, for us in genetics more broadly. And there's been a matching popular interest, which is fantastic because we want that, we want the public to engage with these ideas of what are, we, we think is an incredibly important branch of, of science. One thing that I don't think any of us predicted very well was that there would be also an enormous um, uh, a growth in the commercial genetics market, which is dominated by ancestry testing kits, the two key uh, lead companies in that domain are 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Um, but there are many others and the commercial genetics market is worth billions and the data that is owned by the commercial genetics market in the form of genomes absolutely dwarfs what is in the public sector and what is in the scientific and, and biomedical sector. And that is, I, I think, is, is, uh, it, it is, it is something that we didn't anticipate in the field, but I also think more broadly, I take a very dim view of ancestry testing kits, but I think that more broadly they don't serve our aims of teaching how we think about genetics and how we think about human um, biodiversity uh, today. So that is something that we have to contest with in a, in a way that we didn't anticipate 10 or certainly 15 years ago. Now, um, when we talk about race, we, in, in what is firmly established as, a, as an idea within the sciences now, we talk about race as a social construct. And of course, what that means is that the way we talk about race is effectively a classification system that is very clumsily based on social consensus, uh, rather than any form of sort of biological uh, essentialism or biological fixity, therefore locked in our DNA. So that the, the race exists, um, but it doesn't exist as a useful or um, or meaningful biological uh, construct. So that's what we talk about as a social construct. Often when I find myself talking about this, I find people responding to that idea as if to undermine the idea of a social construct. Some people say, well, you know, you say race is just a social construct. I don't say race is just a social construct. Social interactions, of course, are that dominate how humans interact with each other. Time and money are also social constructs, but you don't get people saying, I'm not going to pay you, or I'm not going to come arrive on, on late to this meeting because time and money are just social constructs. But somehow that gets used as an argument. Social constructs are basically how we interact with almost everyone on earth, and we have biological relationships with very few people. Um, sometimes this gets conveyed as. Um, uh, as the idea that race does not exist. Now, I think this is well-intentioned, but it is fundamentally wrong and not helpful. Um, race absolutely exists because it is a social construct. And as I've said, you know, social constructs are in incredibly important. So that is a well-intentioned error. I've made it in the past. Race absolutely exists because it's a social, uh, by social consensus. And the fact that there isn't a biological, a sound, useful biological underpinning of human variation as we describe it as race, does in no way undermine the existence of a very important way that humans interact with, with each other. Um, now, I'm going to get into the history here because I think this is really important, par partially because it's interesting, but also because, as I said right at the top, the history of our field, which is pretty shallow compared to something like astrophysics, um, is fundamentally still echoes in our in our social descriptions of race today but also has a, has repercussions into the scientific domain as well and um i've I got this, you know, this this nice nice picture of uh, pigmentation variation from around the world and the reason for this is, is because the during the what we fondly refer to as the age of enlightenment which is also the age of colonial expansion european expansion the age of subjugation and and um, enslavement for um, literally millions of people is synonymous with the invention of race 
and the primary phenotype of racial determination in the 17th and 18th century is pigmentation, solely pigmentation initially, and then it changes into other, other forms. So it, this is when we talk about the invention of race. It's not the case that people have, have only started being different in the Age of Enlightenment. And it's not the case that we only started discovering people who were different in the Age of Enlightenment as Europeans expanded around the world. And I'm talking very much from a Western European um, perspective here. But it is the case that the racial classification system that we continue to use as a social construct was invented in the 17th and 18th century by Western scientists, stroke philosophers, natural scientists. Um, and, and the key idea here is that it wasn't invented in parallel with the project of, that we call the Enlightenment, but also European expansion. It was invented to serve that political ideology, right? And this, this is uncontroversial within history. And yet, I've, when I talk about this to other scientists, they often look either surprised or push back against it as, a, as an idea. Um, the, the variation in pigmentation, of course, has been talked about in the whole canon of the oldest texts that we have in, in Western literature. Homer talks about pigmentation, um, differences in pigmentation in the Iliad. He talks about uh, Odysseus being swarthy skinned. He talks about sub-Saharan African people as, as being atheops, which literally translates as blackened face. But this as a categorizer is completely absent in all classical literature, that the othering of different groups of people is predicated on things like culture, language, religion, geography, and there are no examples where it is predicated on a classification which is based on pigmentation. And that again is standard in classical history. This is non-controversial thing to say. Um, we sometimes think about how white and European those the Greeks and Romans were. And a lot of that is influenced by the fact that our marble statues that, that, that the British stole from around the world and stuck in the British Museum are white marble. They were of course painted. In, in, in the time that they were made, heavily painted and colored. And so a lot of that pigmentation information has just been lost, but we have plenty of evidence that there was um, um, plenty of representation of different pigmentations from different people from around the world in classical Europe. Um, but again, none of them appear to be the primary determinant of the othering in order to subjugate a, another people. And again, this isn't to say that, you know, bigotry didn't exist, it just wasn't predicated on the racial terms that we recognize today. There's a sort of um, precursor to what happens during the Enlightenment mentioned by the, the great Uzbeki scholar of Asena, um, who talk, talks about, in one of his books, he talks about um, the Islamic slave trade, which lasted for something like 900 years, and estimates vary, but about 5 million people were enslaved during that time. And he does mention pigmentation, skin color, as a means of determining whether or not a people should be should be subjugated, should be suitable for enslavement. And he talks about sub-Saharan African people um, as becomes standard during the Enlightenment, during the, e the era of, of, of slavery. But he also interestingly talks about um, uh, pale-skinned Northern Europeans as being feckless and stupid and therefore suitable for enslavement. And this is this is, I think, is the first real example of using this particular phenotype in order to justify a political ideology, in this case, um, uh, subjugation of people for en enslavement. But it is, as I said, it's a prelude to what becomes the dominant ideology during European expansion a few centuries later, starting in the sort of 17th to 19th century. And so here's some of the key figures. Um, there, there are many more than this, but here's some that I, I will talk about in uh, a little bit. So just from top row is Linnaeus, and then there's uh, Voltaire, and then that's Immanuel Kant, and the bottom row is Johann Blumenbach, and then there's Francis Galton, middle bottom, and then you all know who bottom right is. Now, all of these men um, and many others were in, involved in the invention of race, but as Europeans expanded around the world, particularly into Africa, all of these, these types of men had a go at classification of humans and the emerging field of anthropology or human taxonomy comes from this relationship between 
mostly men in their salons in, in Western Europe. Most of these guys didn't do a lot of exploration, although Galton spent time in Africa and of course uh, Darwin spent time all over the world on the voyages of the Beagle. Um, um, but it is their exposure via exploration and conquest of European uh, colonialists um, that people are different around the world and they try to apply pseudoscient what we now regard as pseudoscientific criteria to classifying these people. Let me talk about Linnaeus in some detail because he really is one of the most important in this regard. You all know who Linnaeus is, of course. Um, in Systema Natura, of which there are many volumes uh, over, over his life, it's the 10th volume which is important for this, um, for this idea, because he's already got our, our um, uh, binomial taxonomic system in place. Um, he's attempted to classify all living animals and plants and also stones, rocks. I, I, he, that's where we get the game animal, vegetable, mineral from, as a little side note. It's not a binomial tax, taxonomy is not useful for stones. But anyway, he does apply it to all living things. And um, Homo sapiens is, is us. And in the 10th edition, he introduces subspecies, four subspecies. Uh, which you can see on the right there in the original itself but here, here's three of them um and as you can see from these descriptions right homo sapiens americanus the first identify the first phenotype as we would call it that linnaeus uses to categorize these people the indigenous americans is red-skinned for asiaticus which is what we would broadly refer to as east asians today it is yellow skin and for africanus it is black skin and then the next phenotype used is hair texture straight thick stiff black frizzled hair now if you read the rest of those descriptions you will see that they are unequivocal value judgments unequivocally racist value judgments and it's very important that we acknowledge that we don't use contemporary mores to judge people of the past i can say that they're racist quite clearly um, and, and not necessarily in the same way that we think about racism today, but it is descriptively accurate to describe this classification system as, as racist, not least because of description, but also because of something which is absolutely universal in every single one of these types of taxonomies that occurs at this time by all of those people that I showed and, and many, many others, which is that they're not simply classification, they are hierarchical classification, because in every single case, without exception, um, Europeans are described as being superior to anyone else, right? And as you can see from Linnaeus's description, it's very, very clear there. So this is what we mean in the history of science and in history when we talk about the invention of race, which begins at this time with people like Linnaeus, in service of an ideology. It's not happening neutrally or independently of it's not the scientific method applied in, in a way that we would find acceptable today it is the application of what we now regard as pseudoscientific but in order to serve this particular ideology um the the two key arguments that are raging at this time amongst these types of people is monogenism versus polygenism and monoge monogenism so bear in mind that everyone is a biblical um uh, a biblical creationist at this point um and so the story of adam and eve is considered to be the the accurate version of, of the genesis of humankind um the monogenists believed that variation was um was, was derived as people migrated away from the garden of eden as the descendants of adam and eve migrated away physical characteristics were were adopted sometimes described as adaptations um, as people migrated away, whereas the polygenists thought that people migrated away from the Garden of Eden and then in situ um, developed those individual characteristics. Extreme polygenists thought that some types of humans, some populations of humans were different species to white Europeans. I'll talk about that in, in just a second. Just as an in interesting aside, which I don't normally talk about in, in this lecture, but I know you guys will appreciate, if there's a funny sort of recapitulation in the multi-regional hypothesis versus the out of Africa hy hypothesis that occurs in the 1980s with this. I mean, wrong in every single detail, and um, other than that, unrelated, but the idea that there is a single origin um, is sort of in, somewhat in line with uh, with out of Africa compared to a, a polygenic version, which is, which is what the multi, the thankfully long forgotten 
multi-regional hypothesis would say. Now, Voltaire, you know, Voltaire, great hero of the Enlightenment um, and um, a, a great figure in the development of Western philosophy and Western thought and therefore of great importance. He was an ardent polygenist and he was a terrible racist as well. Again, contemporary standards, contemporary, we're not comparing these, these people's views with our own standards, but it is possible to describe Voltaire as an absolute racist because of comparing him to his contemporaries. And that again is something that we do in history. Um, this is a pretty obnoxious quote from him. Uh, he, you can read that for yourself. Um, but he was an ardent believer that sub-Saharan African people are a different species to white Europeans. So again, there's a founding father of Western philosophy who's talking about an absolutely constructed, made up pseudoscientific theory as part of the general and acceptable discourse about human evolution at this time in the in, in this era from the 17th to the 19th century. Blumenbach's an interesting character in this. I know I'm absolutely whizzing through these, but you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about. Blumenbach's interesting because he is someone, he, he's, he's possibly the first person who applies actual metrics. So actual measurements um, in, in a, a way that we would want to do very keenly uh, in science today. Whereas most of the other people were just making observations or in some cases just making it up. But Blumenbach was sent 60 skulls from around um, around the world and attempted to measure them and by measuring various morphological aspects of these skulls came up with five um, five races of humans um, and which was largely in line with with uh, with what Linnaeus had said and all of these people are very deferential so this, this is an era when even though places like the Royal Society and the idea of the rejection of dogma is is becoming part of the scientific methods there is quite a lot of reverence to previous thought. Um, so, so Blumenbach introduces metrics in it and that becomes an idea which as we go from you know Linnaeus saying these are the, the skin colour and behaviours into the current era which is actually applying ever more detailed um, molecular analysis and of course the true you know ocean of variation is is genetics which we understand today. Um, now just come, let's come back to Darwin for briefly and, and talk about Descent of Man. Uh, because I think he is a, a, although a complex character in this story, I think it has overall a, a, a positive, a net positive effect. In The Descent of Man, which features some pretty uh, outmoded language um, and some pretty difficult ideas, which are very, very typical of the Victorian era. And bear in mind that Darwin is an abolitionist and very liberal for his era. He points out that no one can agree on how many races there actually are. And one interpretation of this, one that I think is reasonable, is that there is a slight mocking tone to this, that he's actually saying, look, you don't know how many races there are, look, look, look at the range. Can you hear my dog? No, he's gone quiet. Anyway, um, so that, that's, there, that's right there in The Descent of Man. Um, and he goes on to say, and th this is what's crucial about, about Darwin in The Descent of Man, talking about the races of humans, that he talks of his application of, of evolution by natural selection to humans. He talks very clearly that he doesn't think that any of these particular phenotypes that have been used to classify groups of people, or historical ancestral populations of people or races, are limited to those populations. He talks about how they quite clearly graduate those characteristics, morphological characteristics, graduate into, into each other. And, and he doesn't think that you can find clear, distinctive um, um, uh, characteristics which are unique to the races as described by his contemporary and uh, contemporary scientists and, and, um, and forebears. So he's arguing against the idea of biological fixity and he's arguing against the idea of um, racial essentialism. And, and it, you know, as Darwin did quite a lot, this is precisely what turns out to be true that we, that we know from the end of the 20th century and well into the genomic era that we're in today. He goes on to say that, that he, he doesn't think that any of these characteristics will will be fixed in time and cannot change over generational time. So again, you know, he's thinking about evolution as it applies to humans. We are not exempt from this process. We are not fixed in time, um, as Linnaeus would have described these sort of essential characteristics. As an aside, and I think me and Peter talked about this when I was in New Zealand a couple of years ago, I, I think I'm, a, I'm very much an anti-taxonomist. 
And I think that Linnaeus's legacy, as we still use it today, is incredibly damaging to science. When taxon, oh, there will be some of you who are taxonomists, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry if that's annoying to you. But I think it's a really interesting idea that fund that I, I think fundamentally our attempts to categorize biology um, in these, in the context of someone who was trying to describe Platonic ideals under a creationist model, ultimately does not serve our science usefully. That's a separate conversation, and I can hear flaming anger from taxonomists from 12,000 miles away. Anyway, I mentioned that um, Darwin was liberal and an abolitionist, but I don't want to exonerate him for, he's my intellectual hero, and I have mostly, almost exclusively positive things to say. I think he's the most important thinker in, I, I think he's the most important th thinker in, th in history, and I think evolution by natural selection is the most important idea that anyone ever had. Um, however, despite him being an abolitionist, despite him being a, a, um, um, a, a very liberal for his era, um, he doesn't get a free pass on this. And we think that his, his views about African people were influenced heavily, not just by his travels around the world, um, but by his ta uh, taxidermy tutor when he was studying as an undergraduate at Edinburgh, whose name was John Edmonston, and he was a, a, a former enslaved man who was who, from Guyana, which by coincidence is where my um, mixed race lineage comes from. Um, now, we think that, but we don't know that because Darwin never names him. He never names him in any of his work. And he only describes what we think is John Edmonston as a full-blooded Negro. And so, you know, there's another example of someone who we think his Darwinologists think heavily influenced his, his thinking on particular subjects, and yet he still remains uh, an unnamed character. This is a posthumous portrait, so there is no portrait of John Edmondson um, uh, other than this, this um, painted after his, after his death. Um, Huxley is one worth talking about as well. I know you know who Huxley is, Darwin's greatest defender, Darwin, Darwin's bulldog sometimes referred to as. Um, he had a go at classifying uh, in the 1870s and introduced some, some you know, high degree of granularity than before and came up with sort of 10, 15 different races of people with some terms I'm very grateful didn't catch on. But there's a, there's a point to introducing Huxley, and I'm not putting this on Huxley, but I'm but using him as an example of how the legacy of this Victorian pseudoscience uh, continues uh, echoes into our present very, very demonstrably um, with very clear lines between that pseudoscience and things that have happened within our lifetime. So within Africa, um, Huxley suggests that North Saharan or North, North Africans have lighter skin, refer, he refers to them as melanocroi, that Sub-Saharan Africans he refers to as Negroes, and um, people in, the, in Southern Africa who we might call Khoisan or Khoi Khoi, or sometimes they call themselves Bushmen to this day, um, are also a different race. Now, while, why this is important, and again, stress, this isn't what Huxley says, it's just that the introduction of this as an idea becomes a key part of, of part of the narrative of the 20th century and some of the most pernicious acts of the 20th century. Um, the idea that some people within Africa have paler skin, lighter pigmentation than other people in Africa, became a key idea that was explored by anthropologists and colonialists uh, of, of this time. And it has direct repercussions into the 20th century via the Rwandan conflict, which you'll, you will all be aware of. But you'll know that the Rwandan conflict was, was between the Hutu and the Tutsi. Now, the story goes like this. So, um, until but Bel, uh, till German colonizers arrive um, in the 19th century, relationships between the Hutu and the Tutsi are largely congenial. Uh, Tutsi do have a uh, have various characteristics which are uh, which mean that they have separate ancestry from from Hutu, uh, and they included things like well, slightly paler skin, but also um lactase persistence what we now know is lactase persistence because the Tutsi tend to be historically pastoralists rather than uh rather than hunter-gatherers which the Hutu primarily were at this time now German colonists in the 19th century 
identified the Tutsi as being people that they wanted to engage with um, for, uh, for commercial reasons, more than the, the Hutu, and an invented category of people, uh, historical people, who were known as the Hamites. So they invented the descendants of Ham, um, who, uh, as written in the Torah, have blackened skin, cursed with blackness, the curse of Ham. But they were effectively a lighter skinned group of people from the Middle East. And via introgression into the Tutsi population, that is where the pastoralism and paler skin of the Tutsi comes from, which isn't included in the ancestry of, of the Hutu. Now, th this fiction is invented by German colonists and then adopted by Belgium when they get replaced by Belgian colonists into the 20th century. And more crucially, it becomes adopted by the Hutu and the Tutsi and the people of, of Rwanda. And this is exemplified on this 19, uh, this is from 1950s, I think, identity card, where the, ide the racialization, the eth ethnicity of racial, of racial identity cards becomes law. You can see Hutu and Tutsi right, right there in the ethnicity bracket. So the people of Rwanda buy into this myth. And, and what happens is, as you know, conflict between the Hutu and the Tutsi continue throughout the 20th century. In the late 1950s, the Belgian colonists leave um, and install the Tutsi government. And by the time you get to the 1990s, there's been continuous civil war, which escalates into the genocide that in 1994 uh, resulted in the death of 100,000 people over 100 days. Um, now, that 1994, I was an undergraduate in the Galton Laboratory at UCL, the department that I'm, the Galton doesn't exist anymore, but the department that I, I, am, I am still in. So that this is recent history. I expect m the majority of you listening will know and remember that happening. And the, the lineage between those events and invented pseudoscience of European colonizers is absolute and unquestionable. Um, and so th again, another, albeit extreme, but very relevant example of how the repercussions of historical pseudoscience of race science continue into the current era. Now, we all know, and you all know, that we are, we refer to ourselves as an African species, and, and we give our, we, you know, we show maps like this, which I sort of have a bit of an issue with, that I call them dad's army maps. I think that will work for New Zealanders, but just the notion that they show you know, geological time spans and the migration in very, very broad scales over long distances. Um, I think that these, these sorts of maps are very confusing for people who don't study evolutionary time and human migration over evolutionary time. We talk very casually about migration in human, in, in, in paleoanthropology, when, when the distances and the timings that we're talking about have no bearing, no reference point compared to how we talk about migration today. And yet I often find in my sort of public facing version of these talks that people think about migration as we think about migration today as, you know, Syrian refugees coming to Europe or, or migrations, even in the last thousand years. Um, that I know that Lisa Matthew Smith is, is listening, the, the types of migration patterns that she studies in, uh, in, in the South Pacific, down, down where you are. When we show maps like these, I wonder how useful they are. When we talk about us, Homo sapiens, as being a, an African species, what we mean by that is the majority of our, of our evolution occurred within Africa, and then a very, very small population um, drifted away on average from Africa at some point in the last 100,000 years, maybe 80 or 70,000 years ago, and we call that the out of Africa event. This is another example of how our language, the language that we use in genetics, is familiar but fundamentally different to people outside of the fields that we're working in, and I think it's problematic. This is a, this is a figure from one of my colleagues at, at UCL, which I think is more useful, I much prefer, and he's actually, this is Mark Thomas, Mark Thomas's work, and he's showing something different on this map, but it's um, for my purposes, he's showing genetic diversity scaled by continent, by land mass size. And what we can see is the majority of genetic diversity on Earth uh, in humans occurs within Africa. Um, so I think that, you know, I, 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 I think I'm not, you know, I'd like, like this to be a discussion. I think that's a more useful map in trying to understand human evolution than the migration map that we showed, that I just showed a minute ago. So, um, what's my timing doing? famously bad at timing. Um, I've still got loads to go as well. Right, so what, what we now know is that 
there is more pigmentation within Africa than the rest of the world, which is, you know, if, ever, if you've ever been to Africa, it's completely obvious that that's the case. And yet that is the primary determinant of historical and contemporary racial categorization. We talk about black people when what we mean is people of recent ancestry from a continent consisting of 54 countries and 1.3 billion people that includes a range of pigmentation tones, which is far, far greater than the rest of the world combined, right? So the, the language there is sort of scientifically unsustainable. We now know as well, that as which is obvious from the previous statement, that the there's more genetic diversity in pigmentation genes than in the rest of the world, which is totally unsurprising because there's more genetic diversity within Africa than in the rest of the world. And we also know this is this is um, the work um, of uh, Brenna Hen and Nina Jablonski and um, someone, uh, it's gone from my head, it'll come back in just a second. Sarah Tishkoff, sorry, Sarah. Um, and, and, and we know now from their work that, um, that variation in pigmentation genes predates Homo sapiens by hundreds of thousands of years. Now, again, there's a massive irony in the casualness with which I can say that because we only know that because that work has been done in the last five or, or 10 years, right? And yet again, this primary determinant of phenotype used to categorize people and subjugate them and enslave them for the last several centuries is only something that we started looking at in African people within the last decade. Right, so this is our problem. This is a problem of the genetics community. Um, right, here's a couple of up some slides, um, which we'll just whip through. So race is a social construct. Um, racial groups don't correspond usefully to biological variation, pigmentation, you've got that. And then this key point at the bottom, which is our data sets are hugely skewed towards European ancestry. It, it is understandable why they are because of the history of the sciences because most of the work is done has historically been done in Europe and also because the structural biases that occur within science because science is part of, of society. I think that we need to be aware of these facts particularly the data being biased in our data sets. Um, I did that one and I've repeated it again so I can skip over that. Now here's a point about language that I've mentioned a couple of times but this is a sort of more pointed aspect to it. We use these terms like race, well we don't tend to use race in population genetics anymore, but they do, it is still used in, in, in many papers. Population ethnicity um, and ancestry, these are words that are used in different academic disciplines which have subtly different meanings to anthropologists or population geneticists uh, or medics or genetic counsellors um, and certainly different meanings from how people might use them in, in the street. We don't have agreed norms on this on, on this language. And I think this is something we have to address. I, I, I'm in the process of writing a paper for Nature Genetics with a couple of colleagues where we're asking these questions and giving you know, some, some background to this. I think it's the beginning of a conversation. We certainly aren't proposing answers, but I just think it's important that we, we, we are thinking about this um, right now in our work and in our publications. This is, uh, when, I, when I talk about this, I, uh, and only recently did I think to do something very, very obvious, which is actually just to look at the citations that include some of these words. And this slide shows just the words Caucasian and race in PubMed. And to my horror, and I hope to yours, this is a modern phenomenon. This isn't scaled according to the number of the increase in number of papers. So there is this, this isn't, isn't great data. I only just did this a couple of days ago just to, just to see, but I was incredibly surprised. And if you look in PubMed for the, for the word race or the word Caucasian, it's a modern phenomenon. It ramps up in the 2000s and it may be sloping off now, but the number of citations using the word, those words is at a high now. This is not some artifact from the 19th century. It is something that we are doing as a scientific community today. Now we talked about how useless race is, race is as a, as a uh, scientific concept. Caucasian is worse, right? Caucasian is a scientifically meaningless term, although it largely corresponds to people with light-skinned European ancestry. 
Um, but it really doesn't mean anything, and it doesn't. It, it isn't a cluster which is which has any utility within science or or medicine. And on top of that, it is a word that was invented by Johann Blumenbach, he of the sixty skulls in the eighteenth century, in order to describe European beauty compared to Africans. Right. So here we've got a word which is scientifically invalid and not useful at all, which comes with a shitload of historical racism. And yet we are using it, scientists are using it by the bucket load in contemporary academic papers. That is a major problem, right? That is something we have to be A, aware of, and B, have to stop doing. So we have to get better uh, at our language, which may mean we have to work out, you know, what is the best way to describe populations? And I don't know the answer to that, but, you know, we should be thinking about that. Now, just to finish off, uh, because I haven't been controversial enough, in terms of data, um, there is no more controversial subject within talking about race and psychology than talking about IQ. And this, again, is part of the public discourse today. Um, scientific racists or fringe pseudoscientists often cite this data set and this, this graphical representation of a data set, which I think some of you will be familiar with, um, in terms of looking at national IQs. And this is scaled to, um, with the average being 100 as, as it is up, um, uh, in the UK. Um, but as you can see from this, national IQs, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, deviate from the from 100 by up to two standard deviations, which is phenomenal. And also intuitively simply cannot be correct, right? Because if you look at the diagnostic criteria in DSM for IQ, um, two standard deviations away from 100 in, in IQ means, means a, a, a group of people or an individual who is incapable of surviving without significant help from a, in a 24 hour period. So I mean, it literally cannot be true. And it's not true. It completely isn't true. And in fact, these data, which is forms a data set, which we are trying to work out how many times these data have been cited in academic papers, in textbooks, and in government policy papers. And the answer is, well, we've verified 130 papers. We think that number is going to increase by at least three or four times. So we think, you know, rough estimate, we think that these, these data has been used maybe a thousand times. So a significant data set. And we know if you scrape the surface on this data, it's founded by Richard Lynn, who is a well-known um, white supremacist and, and racist and, and, and one of the key founding, so founding fathers of contemporary scientific racism and, and still was the editor of um, uh, Mankind Quarterly until very recently, which is a ridiculous racist pseudoscience pretend journal. Um, and this data set is, is from him and colleagues. Now, when you look at some of the numbers, um, which people have only really be, been doing in the last few years, um, bearing in mind that these data has been used, you know, like I said, dozens, if not hundreds, if not more than a thousand times, when you look at the actual numbers, what you see is, you know, staggering, IQ levels, staggeringly low IQ levels, particular, particularly in Africa, although the lowest on, on that chart is in Nepal with 43, right? And then you look at the provenance of those data. And what you find is, well, first things first, actually they only have data for, um, I think it's 110 from memory, someone check that, 110 um, countries with national IQ data sets. The rest of them were estimated by averaging the two neighboring countries. I mean, if that's science, I've been doing it wrong for a long time. The second thing is when you look at the actual IQ tests that are applied that, that uh, are the basis of this data, just have a scan through these. So for example, you know, 103 Herero speaking children for Namibia, right? Or rural vitamin A deficient children in Nepal. Um, or children from refugee camps in different countries tested in a different language. Now, I am not an IQ denialist. I think IQ is a very well studied metric and a measure of cognitive capabilities, which has great value at predicting certain things, not least because we've spent 100 years studying it. Right? I'm, I'm not in the camp of saying that IQ is, is only useful for determining whether people are doing good at doing IQ tests. 
that is true, but it's also true for the 100 meters or the driving test or any test. It's a, I think it's a stupid thing to say. Um, I do think IQ has great validity uh, in, in, as, as, a, as a data set that can be used. Psychologists mostly know these, the problems with IQ, um, but outside of the world of scientific racism, the small sort of fringe group of scientific racists and out and in the real world of, of sort of pseudo scientific, so, so the, the data bros who use these kind of data to, to reinforce ideas of scientific racism. Well, this comes up all the time and it's never questioned. And actually, when you look at this data set, which has been used literally hundreds of times, it is a total nonsense. It is a fiction. Um, so, you know, always check the provenance of your data. Don't assume that your data is, is robust or hasn't been selected incredibly with incredible bias, right, with staggering levels of racism built into it. So that's a kind of extreme example of how data can be biased. I think the possibly the less dramatic version is just knowing that our data sets are, are in, in for genomes are almost certainly skewed. And so those, those two ideas, again, that I set up at the beginning, one, science is always political, no matter how hard we think or try to believe that science is above the, the tawdry politics of people and that we pursue ideas that are um, born of trying to remove subjectivity from understanding reality. Science is always political because it's done by people. We need to know that, recognize that, you know, like an alcoholic recognizing that they have a problem. And it's buried in the structure of how we do science because science was invented to serve a political ideology. And then, then the second point, our data is always, always skewed. And you're, I think, slightly provocatively, that if you don't think that's the case or you deny that's the case, then you're not serving science and you haven't been paying attention for the last 400 years. I will stop right there because that's quite enough and I'd much rather have some questions from you chaps. 